Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for, for being here. Um, and thank you for joining us for this very special edition of History Cafe, which we do in partnership with Mohai. Um, I'm, my name is Kiku Hughes. Um, I work for History Link. Um, and today we are so honored to be joined by storied educator and historian Mary T. Henry, who is debuting her new book, Tributes, Black People Whose Names Grace Seattle Sites. Um, I'm going to do a, a little introduction of our guests tonight. Um, first of all, of course, we have Mary Henry, um, a retired Seattle Public Schools librarian and author of Tribute, Seattle Public Places Named for Black People. She is the African-American contributing editor to History Link, the archivist for Epiphany Church, and serves on the board of the Seattle Education Foundation. She has served on the board of the Association of King County Historical Organizations and the Seattle Landmarks Preservation Board. She was the editor of the Black Heritage Society newsletter from 1993 to 2003. And of course, she has contributed many articles to both historylink.org and blackpast.org. We also have us, with us today Bob Henry, which is Mary Henry's proud son and the husband of Marilyn Henry, the illustrator of uh, Tributes. And um, we have, of course, Marilyn Hassan Henry, who is a retired Epiphany School math specialist and a master gardener, and her illustrations are featured in Tributes. Um, I'd like to do a quick introduction to the book before I hand it over to Mary. Um, and I am paraphrasing the praise given to it by Stephanie Johnson Tolliver, president of the Black Heritage Society of Washington State. Um, Tributes, Black People Whose Names Grace Seattle Sites is the long-awaited update to Mary's previous work, Tribute, Seattle Public Places Named for Black People. The book is much more than an inventory of places named for black people. It celebrates the lives and significant legacies that contribute to the history of Seattle and King County. Having a sense of place is a key to understanding how we as residents interact with our city and how this city has interacted with its residents. We know that history, we, we, when we know that history, it fundamentally shapes our understanding of the places we call home. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Mary Henry to the stage to discuss her new work. Thank you so much for joining us. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I want first of all to thank Mohai and History Link for inviting me and also to you for coming. On many of my trips around the state and in Seattle, I always had these questions. Who, what, and why? Who is the person named on a bridge or a road or a building? What did he do? What did he or she do to be so honored? Why isn't there a plaque or something to tell us? When you enter Seattle from the east across Mercer Island, you will be on the Lacey V. Morrow Bridge. Those of you who know who he was, could you raise your hand? Whoa. Well, he was appointed director of highways in 1933 and was the older brother of Edward R. Murrow, the radio broadcaster, for those of you who can remember radio. He grew up in Edison in Skagit County and attended Washington State University. If you are ever in the Bow Edison area, you may pass by a modest house with a sign designating it as the home of Edward R. Murrow. I don't remember seeing Lacey's name there, but during the war, he attained the rank of Brigadier General. Sadly, Lacey Murrow, despondent over his health, committed suicide in 1966 in a hotel room in Baltimore. 
So now you know the man behind the name when you cross the I-90 bridge. One day I discovered this wonderful book by James Phillips called Washington State Place Names. It answered a lot of my questions of who and why and what. My dream was to do something similar about Seattle. My first beginning was a series of posters about landmarks named for minority people in Seattle, which were distributed to Seattle schools. Then there was a slideshow. Then my plan was to write a book about Seattle landmarks named for minority people. Then I realized I wouldn't live long enough to do the research to write the book. <laughs> 25 years ago, I published this book, Tribute. Uh, and it is, it, it contains 22 places named for black people in Seattle, along with brief bios of the people. I received a grant from King County to publish it, and it was distributed to all the Seattle schools. I am really indebted to the students at South Shore Middle School, where I was librarian during the 1970s and 80s for alerting me to the fact that they were unaware of the people for whom the places they visited were named. They swam in Medgar Evers' pool, visited Douglas Truth Library, and Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, but they didn't have a clue. This is what inspired me to write tribute public places named for black people in Seattle. Several years ago, I was encouraged by Georgia McDade and Stephanie Tolliver, president of the Black Heritage Society, to update the book. I began research for it with their support, but during the pandemic, the project faltered. Then last year, Marilyn, my daughter-in-law, suggested that since I had done the research, she could do the illustrations to a day, and we could get a book published before my 99th birthday in November. So I wrote and she drew for two months. My son's Bob, retired Lakeside teacher, and Neil, retired dean of the School of Journalism at UC Berkeley, did the editing. It was really a family project. And then magically, and I really say magically, History Link offered to publish it. And Marie McCaffrey did a fantastic job of designing the book and the cover and Mayor Bruce Harrell graciously wrote the foreword, and Leonard Garfield here wrote a very nice blurb. And though we didn't meet our goal, at least it came out before I'm 100. <laughs> This morning, Bob and I went to City Hall and delivered 100 books to the mayor's office. He had ordered 100 books. So we delivered these books to the secretary. And as we were leaving down this long hall to get the elevator back down to the elevator, suddenly the mayor emerged coming down the hall toward us to thank us for the books. And he also talked about what he planned to do with them. Now, because I have a hearing problem, I didn't hear all he said. So later during the answer, uh, question and answer period, you might ask 
Bob, because he hurt him. And I'd like to say, I should mention here that this book does not presume to contain all of the sites. Three were named after the book was sent to the press. And they are the birth of Pitts Campbell home on 22nd, opened last year, is named for an early civil rights leader and a founding member of the first black sorority. The Seattle School Board voted to rename the Northgate School, which has just been renovated, to the James Baldwin School in honor of the noted author of The Fire Next Time and Go Tell It on the Mountain. Just last month, a street in South Seattle was named Bill Burton Way to honor him for his work with the Rainier Boys and Girls Club. And then just yesterday, I heard that the, a few blocks on East Union are going to be named for the uh, young postman who had the postman sites. And most of these people live or have lived in Seattle and contributed to the life and culture of the city through medicine, sports, art, architecture, music, business, politics, labor, law, and education. Their names are on parks, streets, buildings, a bridge, and other special sites and buildings. Hopefully this book will bring life to the names you see on these sites. It's a little book, but it is hopefully my contribution to the literature of black history in Seattle. 10 of these people are Seattle natives. Three are Garfield graduates and 10 are internationally or nationally known. Interestingly, there are two couples who each, who each are honored separately for their contributions. Several were born before Seattle was settled, but they are prominent in black history. Some of them were my friends or acquaintances, and I'd like to read portions of their bios. There is a water play area on 20th and Yesler and a pathway park which runs from 20th and Jackson almost to Yesler. They are named for Dr. Blanche Leviso. She was one of my very best friends. Dr. Leviso was the first black woman pediatrician in the state and the first medical director of Odessa Brown Children's Clinic, which provides medical, dental, and support services to children in Seattle and King County. It was she who gave the clinic its motto, quality care with dignity. She left her mark on the clinic from the way the staff answered the phone to seeing that the chairs in the waiting room were comfortable. She was a friend and a classmate of Dr. Martin Luther King. In fact, her sister, Juanita, was for a while engaged to him. On his only visit to Seattle, he visited her home. One summer night, after a triumphant victory at the Bridge Center, we were driving home, and she turned to me and said, I don't feel well. Three months later, she died from a fast-growing lung cancer. She was only 59. It was a shock and a great loss. There is a park on Yesler, a fine arts center on Maine, and apartments on Jackson named for Edwin T. Pratt. One of my friends and neighbors told me that she had always thought that the Pratt Fine Arts Center was an extension of the Pratt Institute in New York. 
Mr. Pratt was the executive director of the Seattle Urban League. I served on his education committee, and we sat at my family room table designing the triad plan to desegregate the Seattle public schools. Seattle was blanketed in snow on that January night in 1969 when Mr. Pratt was shot and killed in the doorway of his home. He had lived in Seattle only 12 years, yet his leadership in human and civil rights left an imprint on the fabric of life in the city. A committed integrationist, he believed that the problems of race could only be solved through integrated efforts. The Triad Plan became a turning point and landmark in the continuing struggle against de facto segregation. He also conducted quiet negotiations with the University of Washington, urging the school to improve minority opportunity. In housing, he consistently pushed for integrated neighborhoods. A catalyst and a negotiator, Mr. Pratt led Seattle on a higher road in race relations. There is a center at the University of Washington campus named for Gertrude Peoples, who was a dear friend and a bridge partner. She is the founder of the country's first academic support office for college student athletes. For over 40 years, she was the mother, friend, and academic advisor to athletes at the University of Washington. In 1973, she joined the football coaching staff on their recruitment trips and became the first woman athletic recruiter at a major university. In 2011, she was the first woman and first non-athlete to be honored as a Husky legend. There are scholarships in her name at the school. Dr. Homer Harris was one of Seattle's most handsome men <laughs> and a classmate of my husband's at Meharry Medical College. It was his encouragement which prompted our family to move to Seattle. I had a friend who always said that the sight of him would just make your day. <laughs> There's a park at the corner of 24th and Howell named in his honor and placed along a wall as an artful timeline of Seattle's black history. Dr. Harris, a second generation native, was the first black dermatologist at the state, in the state and was honored by the Black Heritage Society as a pioneer in the field. Harris attended Garfield High School and became the first black captain of the football team in 1933. After completing his training in dermatology, he returned to Seattle to begin his practice. Having been refused office space in the medical dental building due to the color of his skin, he came home and called his friend and prominent Seattle, Seattleite Stimson Bullet about the matter. Now I happen to know this because I did Dr. Harris's oral history and he told me all of this. Very shortly thereafter, the building manager came to the home and offered him office space. He became the first black physician to have an office in the medical dental building and opened doors for other minority professionals. There are many others that I did not know, but found their stories compelling. 
Alice Ball grew up near 23rd and Union and graduated from the University of Washington in 1914. She was the daughter and granddaughter of the first black professional photographers in Seattle. Alice Ball was a chemist who isolated an oil to give relief to leprosy patients. And it was the only help for them until the 1940s. There's a delightful little park in the Greenwood neighborhood named for her. And I believe the University of Washington had some influence in the Seattle Park Department about naming that park for her. Denise Hunt was an architect who had a major influence on the practices that shaped the waterfront, Benaroya Hall and Westlake Plaza, and who was also instrumental in the formation of the Northwest African American Museum. She was the first black woman in the United States to serve as president of a local chapter of the American Institute of Architects. There are scholarships in her name at the University of Washington. One of my favorites is Tyree Scott, a leader who opened doors for women and minorities in the construction industry. He led dramatic demonstrations shutting down major construction sites throughout Seattle to protest the impossible position of minority workers. They ran a bulldozer into an open pit at the University of Washington and marched on the flight apron of SeaTac Airport to halt traffic. These demonstrations precipitated the first federal imposition of affirmative action upon local governments and industries. And it was because the United States Department of Justice filed suit against the unions in 1969. So, arts, healthcare, education, you name it. Black hands have made an imprint on Seattle's landscape. Hopefully, as you pass by these buildings, sit in their parks, and drive down their streets, you will remember these people and their contributions. I, I like to uh, make a contribution that I'm sure you're probably aware of, but in case you're not, I'm Dr. Jeffrey Perkins, Jr., and I've been retired for several years. But when uh, I came here, I was teaching about a decade ago, and then I started consulting, writing grants for different community organizations out here, and I brought several millions of dollars to the streets of Seattle to, at community grassroots levels. But one of my most interesting finds during my research when I was, you know, I would go to Antioch or a community college and then I spent this wonderful time in Seattle. It's one of the most incredible places I've ever lived in in my life. You can easily fall in love with this here highly densely populated town. But what I found, um, I got a grant um, and I was hired with working with this woman, Diane Ferguson, who was head in the Central Senior Center at the time. And, we had a grant to preserve the stained glasses, glass windows at the first AME church here in Seattle. And uh, under my research, uh, as I was in there, you know, uh, scouting the place, and I had some of the people help me to move the benches from the pews at the higher level. And what I uncovered was William Gross. Now, how many people are aware of William Gross? He purchased the central district land that, that started the central district, he, when he gave Henry Yesler a thousand gold pieces. So when I'm looking at, then I went to Lakeview Cemetery, I spent a lot of time there and I saw all of the original pioneers and the whole Gross family is up there. William Gross was an ex-slave who became free and he came here to Seattle. Uh, but to make a long story short, 
what, what I uncovered when we moved them benches back, and it's probably still there, William Gross was a Freemason, and his signature are on those stained glasses, him, his wife, and his daughter, all of them like they're at Lakeview Cemetery, so there's a research project for, that needs to be told. I'm retired, I'm doing too much, but William Gross was such a fascinating character in the Seattle area. He founded the Central District, and there's much more. There's so much untold stories here. I applaud you for bringing this out because when I came here, I saw these parks, but I didn't know who the people were. So I'm going to stop now, but I said that there are still a lot of untold stories here. Even the archives at the University of Washington Library, I looked at some of the newspapers that are not digitized that was run in the Central District. And I uncovered just so many different people who have been up here. And it's just incredible. So thank you very much. And I look forward to buying your book. <laughs> he, loved, he loved your book. Is nobody going to ask him about no. what the mayor said he's going to do with the book? <laughs> There's the question right there. <laughs> so what did the mayor Am I up? So, um, as my mother described, we were uh, this morning just delivering books. <laughs> just want to do a delivery and get out and go to the next things. But as we're departing, the mayor approaches us and he just comes, shakes her hand, and tells her how wonderful it was that this book is out and how ordering 100 of them is going to be a gift um, to a number of people who will be coming through the office, vig visiting dignitaries, um, people who would, who would appreciate knowing that this city is built on many people from many backgrounds, um, and that uh, it's, it's a proud history. And these, member, these individuals and more um, uh, are, are the reason for that pride. Um, yeah, that was, he, he, he began talking about that this book evoked for him um, the griot um, uh, phenomenon or story in, in African tradition. The griot is the storyteller who carries on the stories of the, the tribe or the people. Um, and it's handed down, the, those stories are handed down generation to generation to generation uh, as most historical ancient cultures Homer was a griot in his own way. The uh, ancient rabbis and, and the and various uh, holy people were griots of their time and places. And so he sees this person as a griot, <laughs> a griot. He wrote a beautiful uh, forward for the book. Very, very lovely. He was very gracious. <sighs> Thank you. Thank you. Anybody got a question for the illustrator? No. <laughs> Hi, great grandma. I was wondering what the most enjoyable part of writing the book was. What was the most enjoyable part of writing your book? That would be uh, your other, your other grand, great grandson. <laughs> Thank you, Darrow. That's my other great grandson. <laughs> the greatest joy was to get it done. <laughs> but I think you also enjoyed um, just the, the discovery. Um, of, well, I, of I enjoyed the, the, the interplay with these two and my other son. I mean, it was just a great family project, and we all had input in it, and I thought that was just great. 